Okay, so we are going to start in chapter three, which is on Laplace transforms. I'll abbreviate as LT, and I'm thinking this is probably at least the third time you've seen these, right? Solve them in circuits two, also in differential equations. You'll see them in this class. You'll use them a lot next semester in your control systems class. Because Laplace transforms are used often for when we study control systems because um, they can help us answer questions about stability and controllability. Um, on the other hand, some of your communications courses and your filter design classes, uh, they're the Fourier transform tends to be uh, used more often than, than the Laplace transform. But um, basically, it provides an easier method for us to, to find the system output than convolution. So we'll start with the definition of the Laplace transform, it's an, it's an integral. And the Laplace transform, so the notation typically used is the capital letter represents the Laplace transform. S is the Laplace transform variable, it's, it's a complex frequency. So you, you'll see this notation, that's a script L the Laplace transform of a time domain function. And we define it maybe slightly differently than you did in your differential equations class. The notation here on the, on the lower uh, limit of integration is zero with a subscript minus. So we use that notation to indicate just before zero. So it includes the impulse Include, and includes the edge of a unit step. So I think typically in differential equations, they may actually start at zero or even zero plus, because they exclude um, uh, functions like impulses. So S is a complex variable. It has a real part, standard notation, we call that sigma. And then the imaginary part of S is a frequency variable we call omega. Um, now the, the inverse Laplace transform can also be found via integration, but it's actually a contour integral in the complex plane. So you may have looked at contour integrals in, in Calc 3, um, but we're not going to use that definition of uh, the inverse Laplace transform to find inverse Laplace transforms. Instead, we'll use uh, a table lookup method and partial fraction expansion to, to come to go from the Laplace domain back into the time domain. So no one really likes to integrate, and the rules are hard. Um, but at least initially, we have this is all we've got to work with. So at least initially, in some of the homework problems, we use this definition to find Laplace transforms. But our goal here is to learn enough about the Laplace transform, in particular the properties, build up a small table of transforms, a small table of properties, so that we can avoid direct evaluation of this integral. So. By, by the definition, this is the integral from uh, zero minus to infinity of ut e to the minus st dt. Um, here, the zero minus for an impulse, it, uh, for a unit step, it doesn't matter. We have to take into account uh, the difference between zero minus and zero plus for, the, for an impulse, but for a unit step, it doesn't matter. Uh, and so this is actually from zero to infinity of e to the minus st dt 
you carry out that integral, you know, you get minus one over s evaluated at zero and infinity. We'll say e to the minus infinity is, is zero. We're left with just one over s for the loss transform of a unit step. The other notation you'll see is, you know, double arrow. I typically draw it like this, indicating a time domain function as corresponding to a Laplace transform. So again, what this, what ultimately we use the Laplace transform for is is to transform these differential equations for our systems into uh, into uh, polynomial expressions, uh, an algebraic problem. Another simple example is x of t is equal to the impulse corresponding to Laplace transform, zero minus to infinity of delta t e to the minus st dt. Well, we can use the multiplication property there. So delta t times e to the minus st, that's delta t times a time function that we evaluate at the location of the impulse or t equal to zero. So this becomes e to the zero or one. And then the integral over the impulse is one. So delta t Laplace transforms into, into one. Uh, some others that I'm not going to derive, but just to give us a small table so that we can use some properties to derive additional results. This is a really common one. You know, we, we've worked a lot with the Kang exponentials already on our convolution table, but e to the minus a t u of t uh, convolves as one over s plus a, and then t u of t, Laplace well, so transforms. T u of t uh, transforms as one over s squared. Um, that's a special case of e to the minus a t u of t. We can there's nothing in this definition actually that says that a has to be a real number. So if we let a be j omega, then this becomes um, one over s uh, minus j omega zero because a is minus j omega zero. And similarly we could find e to the minus j omega zero would be one over s plus j omega zero. And this then leads to from from Euler's formula haven't really proven that the Laplace transform is, is linear. But cosine of omega zero t we can write as uh, one half e to the j omega zero t plus one half e to the minus j omega zero t like this from Euler's formula plus e to the minus j omega zero t all times u of t and then with a little bit of algebra you can add these to put them over a common denominator. And you get the Laplace transform of a cosine is s squared plus omega zero squared. Um, I guess I'll, I'll note here that in our definition, since we're starting at zero, what's going on for negative time um, isn't of interest uh, to us in this problem. And the Fourier transform that we'll that we'll look at it goes from minus infinity to infinity. But the Laplace transform, we've got a special time zero where something happens. You know, we, we turn our power supply on, we, we turn our voltage source on, 
what happens prior to that, we uh, aren't interested in, okay, and uh, with our loss transforms. And then, so similarly, you could take the, the difference to get sine omega t, omega zero t u t becomes omega zero over s squared plus omega zero squared. Um, if you if you look back at the transforms we have so far, you know uh, a lot of them are in this form of you know, they're, they're rational functions. Uh, we've got a numerator over a denominator, okay, one over s, one over s plus a, one over s squared, one over s minus j omega zero, uh, s over s squared plus omega zero. Uh, the more the most general case is actually a polynomial in s in the numerator over a polynomial in s in the denominator, and that's that's fairly typical. And so leads to a discussion of what are called the poles and zeros of the Laplace transform. So generally, we can write, I'll use n to represent the numerator polynomial and d to represent the denominator polynomial. So uh, a lot of Laplace transforms that we'll look at, almost all of them have this form or at least a part of the transform will, will uh, have this form. The roots of N of S, the roots of the N of S polynomial, so you set N of S equal to zero and solve for the roots of that polynomial, those are called the zeros of the Laplace transform, right? Where N S is equal to zero, the Laplace transform will also be equal to zero. But what happens when the denominator is zero? 1 over 0 gives you infinity, right? So those are called the poles of the Laplace transform. So, so the roots of the numerator are the zeros of the Laplace transform. The roots of the denominator are called the poles of the Laplace transform, P-O-L-E-S. And the reason for that is when we start plotting the magnitude of the Laplace transform, now it's, it's a, it's a complex function of a complex variable. So when we start looking at the plot of it, we have to actually plot it over the complex plane. And if you look at the magnitude, you can, we'll end up with these surface plots. And where the denominator is zero, if you look at the surface plot, that's where that, that plot is gonna to go, to go to infinity. So if you can think of this thing as being stretched out over the complex plane, what, what you end up with and I certainly don't have the artistic ability to do this. And I'm getting a little ahead of, of where we are anyway. This is the sigma and the j omega axis. Okay. Wherever there's a, a zero, okay, and we typically ind indicate zeros in the complex plane by putting down a little zero, that's where the magnitude would be zero. And so whatever surface we, we draw is nailed to the floor there, nailed to that complex plane. Wherever there's a pole, I'll put a pole back here, that's where the surface would go to, would go, become infinitely large. So it's gonna be nailed down to the floor wherever there where there's a zero, and then it goes to infinity wherever there's a pole. So it looks like a, a tent pole, if you can visualize that surface, is where the terminology comes from. Um, so often instead of right now, instead of doing this 3D plot, it's simpler to actually just do what's called a pole zero plot. I'll show you what that looks like, and that's just indicating where the zeros and poles are in the complex plane. So, pole zero plot of the Laplace transform 
of x of t equal e to the minus 2t u of t. And that's one of the transforms we have already. So that's 1 over s plus 2. So there are no roots of the numerator. It's a constant. But the root of the denominator is s equal to minus 2. Okay, so it has a real valued root of the denominator or pole. Now, so I can sketch that. This is how we, so this is, here's my, my real axis, the real part of S, or omega, and then this is my imaginary axis, uh, imaginary part of S. It's an S, imaginary part of S, or omega. In this case, my pole is on the real axis. It's a real number. It's at s equal to minus 2. So I'd indicate that just with that point. Yeah, this is, here's minus 1, here's minus 2, 0, 1, 2. Now, a pole 0 plot actually allows me to reconstruct the Laplace transform. I know that there is a pole at minus 2 here that would correspond to an s plus 2 term in the denominator. There are no zeros here, so to within a constant anyway, you know, 10 over s plus 2 would actually have the same pole 0 plot as 1 over s plus 2. So would 100 over s plus 2. Okay, the constant doesn't show up here in, in my pole 0 plot, but just by looking at the pole, I can reconstruct the Laplace transform. So there's a lot of information here that we can uh, gather just visually from looking at the pole zero plot. Um, you probably have already heard, maybe in circuits, that we've got a, a stable system. If the poles are in the left half plane, did you talk about that in circuits at all? Or have you heard that expression? Some of you have you know, depended on your instructor. That, that means that you know, here's the right half of the complex plane. Here's the left half. If the poles are in the left half of the S plane, that means that they have a negative real part, which corresponds to a decreasing exponential, e to the minus 2. And a pole here at 2 would correspond to an e to the plus 2t. And so again, we'll get there in that discussion, but if this is the Laplace transform of the impulse response, we know that an exponentially increasing impulse response is an unstable system. That would correspond to a pole in the right half of the S-plane. It doesn't have to be on the real axis. It might be have an imaginary component, but all the poles have to be in the left half plane in order, all the poles in the, Laplace transform of the impulse response have to be in the left half plane in order to have a stable system. So if this were an impulse response, this would be a stable system. You can tell that immediately by looking at the pole zero plot. Um, let's look at another one, a little more interesting. The pole zero plot of The Laplace transform of x of t equal cosine of 2t u of t. So we already have the Laplace transform for, for this. S over s squared plus, in this case, omega 0 is 2. So it comes directly from this. Actually, so 2 squared or 4. Uh, that actually has imaginary roots. I mean, apply the quadratic equation to find the, the roots of this second order term. We can write it as s minus j2 times s plus j2. That's the factorization. s times s gives us the s squared. We've got minus j2s plus positive j2s. That, that, can't, that would cancel out the middle term. 
then the last term is minus J2 times plus J2, which gives us plus four. Okay, so this is the factorization. So in this case, sigma J omega, where is the zero of this Laplace transform? What value of S causes the numerator to be zero? S equal to zero. That, that's here at the origin. Okay. So, so a zero there would correspond to an S term in the numerator. If I did a pull zero plot of one over S, I'd actually have a pole at the origin. And then I have poles at plus J2 and minus J2. So they would be along the imaginary axis. Um, plus J2 and then minus J2. And we'll talk more about this. But again, I, I can from just a pole zero plot reconstruct to within a constant the Laplace transform. All the information there is it, all of the information is in the pole zero plot, except for that constant term. I need one additional piece of information. To, I, I would need the value at a particular point. Okay. Any questions about that? Octave MATLAB actually has a, what is it? I think it's called the PZ plot or, or um, I forgot, but uh, a function that you can pass it this um, Laplace transform and then it will actually produce this pole zero plot for you. It's briefly, we'll go through some, some properties. And I, I use the notation X of, X of T transforms of X of S. Sometimes I use a double arrow, sometimes it's a single arrow. Okay, but it represents the same thing. X of T transforms of S, X of S. So what are, uh, in, just like we, we use some properties of convolution to avoid having to go back and evaluate the convolution interval. We can prove all of these properties by going back to the integral definition. Okay. So if you know the Laplace transform of X of T, you can find the Laplace transform of a time scale version of X of T, X of A T. And its Laplace transform is one over A, X times S over A. And A has to be greater than zero, it has to be positive for that to be true. Probably the most important property, if I had to pick one, is in terms of how often it's, it's used is the time shifting property. So X of T minus T times U of T minus capital T. This is a X of T shifted to the right becomes the original Laplace transform times E to the minus capital T S. So let's look at how we apply that, that property actually oh, I'll give you guys a few minutes to work on this because um, if you make an error doing it and we correct it maybe you'll remember it won't make the error again okay. so the example once you find the Laplace transform of e to the minus 2t of t minus four. And what we know, because we've got this transform already, do I have it on the board? Yeah, e to the minus two t u of t transforms as 
1 over s plus 2. So I guess the question is, you know, can we apply the time de time delay property or the time shifting property to find the Laplace transform of the original function of uh, given that? And again, you have to be a little careful there. So, but I'll give you a, a minute to write that down. Okay, so I usually like to define these, I call intermediate functions. They help me avoid mistakes. But this is what we have you know, in our short table. We have the Laplace transform of this W of T is equal to one over S plus two. Now, how do we want to apply the, the time shifting property? Well, it is a, it's a mistake to say that x of t is w of t minus 4. That, that's not correct. Right? Because w of t minus 4 is e to the minus 2 t minus 4 u of t minus 4. So that's not what we have. So, In other words, this is not the time shifted version of, of this. So you have to do some algebraic tricks. It would be if I had a t minus four there, right? So the question is, can I, can I do an algebraic trick so I can get a, a t minus four there? Sure. Right, just subtract and add four. Now I can I can rewrite this as pulling out the plus four, I'll have e to the minus eight, e to the minus two, t minus four, u of t minus four. This is just a constant term. It's a number, right? E to the minus eight. I just use the property of exponents there. So Add the exponents and I get back to that. This then is a time shifted version of W of T. So X of S is going to be this constant times from the time shifting property. It's my original function times E to the minus capital T S. So in other words, I could, I can write X of T is E to the minus eight W of T minus four. So X of S would be the same constant times W of S times E to the minus four S. That's the time shifting property. Right, right here. Or so e to the minus eight, ws is one over s plus two, e to the minus four s. I could combine the exponents here, make it look a little prettier. e to the minus four s plus two, and write it like that. Now, if you notice, this is not in the form of a rational function in S because of this exponential term here, right? It's got this one term in front of it that's in the, the uh, rational polynomial in S. 
But anytime you have this e to the minus something s, that's going to correspond to a time delay. And we'll be using this, these tables going in both directions. You know, if, we, if we've got a Laplace transform, we'll come back into the time domain, we use this side. But anytime you see like this exponential with something to the multiplying s there, you know that's going to come back as the time delay property that time should be proper. So this is the corresponding. Okay. Any questions about that? Okay. What, what if you were given, uh, let's say y of t is equal to minus 2 t minus 4 u of t. The temptation is try to force a t minus 4 n at the u of t, but this is not a time shifted function. This actually becomes non zero at the origin. So you have to do a little algebraic trick, but it's a really simple one. This is just e to the 8, e to the minus 2t u of t, right? It's just e to the 8 times x of t. It's not a time shifted version. It's not a time shifted function. Here, this one is, right? It's u of t minus 4. So it doesn't start until four seconds later. But the problem is, I don't have a t minus 4 everywhere. So I have to do this algebraic trick. This is not a time shifted function. So I want to actually write it as e to the something t u of t. And so y of s is then just e to the 8 x of s. Uh, or WS, I call it here, uh, one over S plus two, and we're done. So you have to be a little careful. Yeah. Other examples, um, we haven't talked about T U of T. And this is a time delayed function, but it's not a time delayed function, not a time delayed version of t u of t. So this one I have to I have to do this little trick, t minus two plus two u of t minus two, which I, I can then write as t minus two u of t minus two plus two u of t minus two. This is a time delayed ramp. This is a time delayed unit step. Multiplied by two. The the I have to roll around the alphabet here. The other corresponding version is that t minus two u of t, and that is not a time delayed function. And I write this quite simply as t u of t minus two u of t. And then find the transform of that. We haven't gotten to that uh, that part of the table yet, I don't think. But um, I'll quickly give you some other results, and we'll, we'll look at some problems. Um, frequency shift e to the minus a t x of t becomes x of s plus a. So an example would be x of t is e to the minus 2t cosine of 2t u of t. So I already know the Laplace transform of cosine 2t ut. This is in the time domain, I've got that same time domain expression now times e to the minus 2t. So since cosine of 2t u of t transforms as, and this is one of the transforms we had earlier, s over s squared plus 2, from this frequency shifting property, 
I know multiplying by e to the minus 2t, I'm going to end up replacing s with s um, plus 2 everywhere. Okay. Notice here it's e to the minus 2t, a is plus 2. So this becomes s plus 2. And so x of s, I replace s with s plus 2 everywhere. I can do a little work on the denominator, expand out that first term, complete the square, and then add the add the constants, but I'll leave it, I'll leave it in that form. Okay. And then the, the last one I'll, I'll I'll give before we look at is time differentiation, because we can also differentiate with respect to that S x prime of t or dx dt transforms as s x of s minus x of 0 minus. And we'll need this part, x of 0 minus, when we start talking about circuits. If we, if we have voltages across capacitors or currents to inductors, this will become our, our initial conditions. Similarly, x double prime of t transforms as, just multiply all of this by s, and then the initial condition on the first derivative. So in the, in the textbook, He's got a bunch of, there's a, a table here. I'll, I'll bring this in a, in a handout, actually a more complete table next time. But here's got some of the properties. We've gone through several of them at this point, not all of them. There aren't many more. But then on the next page is a, we've got 16 different transforms here. Um, so these are the transform pairs. So the idea now is to actually use these properties and transform pairs to avoid having to go back to the definition of, of the transform. So Let's see, uh, from 3.1, we'll do E, calls it X5. First thing we want to do is, is write down a time domain expression for X5. So we just did this in, in the exam. So write down a time domain expression x5 of t as a sum of you know, you know, ramp, ramps, unit steps, I'll give you a minute to do that while I erase the board. So what's the slope of that first segment? Negative uh, five, right? Negative five. And then that time, that's times R of T. And then to that, we add plus five R of T minus two. Again, we're not done. That would give us a graph that looked like this. So we need to add in 10 
u of t minus 2. And then that should then give us an expression for that blue line. So I know we've got a Laplace transform for u of t. That was, I think, the first example we did. It was 1 over s. And so we just have to apply the, the time delay property to that to get that part. Do we have in our table a ramp? Um, not explicitly, but this is a ramp, right? T u of t. Okay, so let's let's just rewrite this using that notation by t u of t plus five t minus two u of t minus two plus ten u of t minus two. Now again, what what I usually like to do, you know, we've got two ramps here, t u of t becomes um, so 1 over s squared. So t minus 2, u of t minus 2 would become 1 over s squared e to the minus 2s. Right? That's our time delay property. That's on the previous table. I'm not gonna, and I erased it over there. And then u of t transforms as 1 over s. So u of t minus 2 transforms as 1 over s e to the minus 2s. And I'm going to back up here so I don't draw on that. So now I put all the pieces together. x5 of s is equal to um, minus 5 1 over s squared. That's this first term, and then I'm going to have uh, plus 5 times that, plus 5 over s squared e to the minus 2s. And then finally, I've got 10 times this, plus 10 over s e to the minus 2s. Um, can't do a lot with that. Slide over, factor out. Uh, five over s squared, I guess. We get minus one here, minus e to the minus two s, and then uh, plus two s e to the minus two s. 10 over s. I'm not sure that looks any better, but that, that would be the that would be the result. Any questions? Easy peasy. Lemon squeezy. All right, that's that's it for today. Have a good weekend. That's not Friday, so sorry. I'm going to go to the